Let me join the Chairman of the Interministerial Committee and SGF in thanking and commending our guest lecturer, uh, Professor Oladakwa Folavi, who, as we've seen, is not just uh, a leading light in biochemistry, but also a leading uh, public intellectual and one who has spent a great deal of time reflecting on issues of governance and national development. And it's very evident from, what, from his lecture uh, that he has spent a great deal of time thinking about these issues as, uh, and not just thinking about it, but putting his thoughts uh, into writing. And when a subject like this is discussed, of course, uh, it often raises a fair amount of emotion. But I'm happy that he has done, uh, delivered this with so much wit, so much humor, and uh, so much experience that we've all enjoyed the presentation very much and I believe we've all learned a great deal. And there are quite a few issues which he has raised and I think that uh, just has been said, we will all, I hope, get copies of this lecture and we can, I'm sure that we can all get emails of it even if we don't get uh, hard copies, we can get electronic versions of, of this. But I think that a lot of what he has said is very important and we ought to you know, have an opportunity, especially those of us who are seated in this room, every one of us clearly qualifies to be described as the elite in the Nigerian society, without a doubt, including uh, the press who are here. Everyone qualifies to be described as that elite. And from his definition, we, we certainly will qualify. There the, the, the are a few issues which he's mentioned, which I think uh, I would like to uh, just elaborate on just slightly. For instance, the question of national unity, you know, uh, the unity of diverse tribes, faiths, and classes in society. You know, and I think it makes a very excellent point that we're not the only country that is diverse in tribe or faiths or in classes. So this is not a peculiar problem. We're not the only country uh, that has these sorts of problems. In fact, the latest, uh, uh, the, the latex explosion on account of diversity of that sort was, uh, uh, was uh, Rwanda, where over a million people were slaughtered. You know, and of course we know the experience thereafter and what has happened since. So th this is not peculiar to us, you know. And I, I, and I think that he's made the point very well, that the way by which a country then becomes united is that it is only possible if there is a deliberate effort by law, by policies, by conventions to create the basis for that unity. There must be a deliberate effort to create the basis for the unity. The components of that basis include equity, justice, the rule of law, accountability, and he describes it, uh, in, in, and, and I, I like the description that he uses. Enforcement of consequences for bad behavior, which is how he describes it. That there must be enforcement of consequences for bad behavior. Equal access to opportunity. A fair basis for government appointments. Intentional programs for the poor, the weak, the vulnerable, and those who cannot work. So the social investment programs and those sorts of things. The welfare programs for those who cannot work. I think that, you know, uh, just the, f the first few statements that Professor Afalabi made, the problematic of a lack of ideological framework for our political parties, which uh, the SGF also uh, very ably put uh, summed up to say that, well, sometimes it looks like uh, there isn't much of a difference between uh, the two. But I think that something that is clear is that there is a deep tension that exists between, not just between tribes, faiths, and all of that, you know, but between those who have and those who do not have. The gap between the elite and those who are not. And that gap is one that we have to look at very, very carefully because, yes, we sometimes want to cover it up in tribe or religion and all of that, but there is a real, there is a real tension between those who have and those who do not have. So the poor in Jibia, in Katsina, or in Binji, or Bodinga, in Sokoto, or Zurmi, Maradun, somewhere in Zamfara, or Anyocha North, or yeah, South, 
in Delta are the same. They have the same needs. They want food, shelter, and clothing. So the real question that the elite have to answer is how do we ensure that there is equity? How do we ensure that there are equal opportunities? How do we ensure that, we, that these tensions do not blow over, just as SGF has said? That there is a, there's a problem. There's a real problem there. And I think elitism, as Professor Afolabi points out, confers privilege. There are rights that no one else has. Privilege ordinarily comes with responsibility, and I think he made that point eloquently, that privilege comes with responsibility. We who are the elite are a privileged class, but privilege comes with a responsibility. It's the French who describe it in the words noblesse oblige, the responsibility of privilege. There is a privilege that comes with what we, who we are as the elite. The first responsibility, and, and, and I want to suggest that uh, the first responsibility of the elite is sacrifice. Sacrifice. The ability to make sacrifices on behalf of the communities that they represent. As Prof described it, is from the etymology of leadership, he says it means go forth to die go forth to die, that that is the original etymology of leadership. People who are prepared to make sacrifice, even if it's not the ultimate sacrifice, people who are prepared to sacrifice on behalf of their communities, that readiness to sacrifice is so important. Now, the temptation for the elite is to seek benefit only and not to sacrifice. That's the temptation that we have as the elite, whether we're political elite, religious elite, or the intellectual elite. The point is that the temptation always is to seek benefit for ourselves. I'll take an example. Let's just say a national program for young people. We have a national program for young people called NPA. Job opportunities for 500,000 or 1 million young men and women. Now, there are two options. We either allow the program to run fairly and justly, to apply so that young people can apply from wherever they are, in, the, in this country, and they have a fair chance of being selected for that program. That's a possibility. The second possibility, the alternative, is for the elite in government, either in the executive, the legislature, or perhaps even the judiciary, to say, let us give ourselves slots. Let's give ourselves slots. So you, in the National Assembly, take 500. We, in the executive, take X number of people. When we give ourselves slots, it is because we are not prepared to make the sacrifice that would enable these young people to say, I belong to a country where there is equal opportunities. But we want to make, but we want them, but we want these young people to believe in the country. We want them to believe that they, they belong to a country. We want a united country. But we're not prepared to make the sacrifice that is required. So the moment I become a minister, or PAMSEC, or director, or the moment I become a member of the House of Representatives, or a senator, I believe that I have certain rights and privileges, and I must maximize them. In maximizing them, I jeopardize the basis for national unity, equal opportunities for all. The president, the, the, the president, when we started the Empire Program, one day the president called me, that President Muhammad Buhari, our president called me, and said, something happened this morning. He said, I was listening to the Hausa BBC service, and two young men called from Bauchi State. They said, we applied for the Empire program, and we didn't know anybody, and we were taken. They are just accepted, and we have started receiving our salaries. Thank you, Baba Buhari. He told me this story himself. This was in 2017 or 2018, I can't remember. And he said, look, if this is possible, if this is possible, then all these young people, all these young people, can truly begin to believe in this country. That there was a time when you would apply for things and you would get them. So the truth of the matter is that these things are possible, but they're only possible if the elite is prepared to make the sacrifice. The, 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 the story, 
the story, the story of successful societies is really quite simple. It's usually how the story of the society's elite, its best educated, its political class, its religious class, influence and direct and lead their societies to progress. Put differently, every successful society is the product of a conscious elite consensus. The implicit and explicit agreements of the elite to change their societies for good. But the elite must be prepared to make the sacrifices for the benefit of everyone. When we look at the great charters of society, the great charters of human rights, the Magna Carta, many, many centuries ago, the American Declaration of Independence, the enthronement of the rule of law, justice according to law, the introduction of welfare programs, ed free education, progressive taxation. These were products of an elite consensus in those nations. But the consensus is not always out of altruism. And I'm saying that the elite does not have to be saints. It's not just out of because we are good people. No, it is also out of self-preservation. The elite must recognize that the reason why we even make some of these sacrifices is not because we are necessarily good people. No, all of those who drafted the American Declaration of the Independence, Magna Carta, etc., were not the best people. No, some of them were criminals, some of them were corrupt, some of them were cheats, they were doing all sorts of things. But they realized that for society to remain together, for society to work, if they would not be completely destroyed, they had to make the sacrifices that were important. Most of the political and bureaucratic players were people from the best schools, but in those societies, there was corruption also, there was abuse of office, violation of the rights of others, but the elite kept their focus on the core values of society. Look at taxation, for example, progressive taxation. The elite could say that we will not, we will not pay taxes, only the poor would pay taxes. But they realize that in order to keep society together, the richer you are, the more tax you'd have to pay in absolute terms. So they created a progressive taxation system, not because they were, not because they are nice people, generous people, they realize that if you don't create a system where everybody contributes, one day there'll be nothing to contribute, everything will be destroyed by the same people who you are oppressing. Making sure that misconduct is punishable is so important. Wrongful conduct will not become the norm. In many of the societies, look at the rule of law, the questions of the rule of law. How do they come about the rule of law? How do we all agree that we will allow a certain set of people to be called judges and they can send us to jail or even say that we should be executed and killed? And the elite have to say all of us will be subject to the law, all, no exceptions. How did they come about that? They could have said, only some will be tried before the courts. We who are the elite will not, will not subject ourselves to the courts. It will never have worked. So, the, so every step of the way in human civilization and the bringing together of societies has been by the sacrifice that the elite have made. They have sacrificed their privileges, and because they've sacrificed their privileges, their societies have moved forward. Where the elite fails in the responsibility, the society itself eventually fails. I'll leave you with a story. In 1994, uh, I served as uh, a United Nations Justice Sector expert in Mogadishu in Somalia. I was working at the time for, for the United Nations. The country had virtually failed then. After several years of misrule, corruption, neglect of social justice, and disregard for the rule of law, the nation was now effectively managed by warlords, area boys, or whoever you call them. They were just, they were, they were the ones who managed that entire society. Every part of the city and country had, it, had its own reigning warlord. This was a society that had everything. It had a system of justice, proper system of justice. There were judges, there were all sorts of people. Everything, the elite was there. But eventually it failed because the elite had not responded to the needs of their society. At that time, there was hardly any food. There was chaos everywhere in, in, in Mogadishu where, where we lived with the UN. In one of the camps, 
in one of the camps where hungry men and women queued up for food in a long line with bowls in their hands. On the line, on that line, were former university professors, and uh, with all due respect to the Professor Falapi and myself, former in the, in the same line, holding their bowls of food, waiting on line to, be, to, to, to receive food from the United Nations. Former senior public servants, former Supreme Court justices, former journalists, all hungry, waiting in the line with their little bowls for food from the World Food Program. In 1981, when I started teaching, my first conference, the very first conference I attended, there were three justices who came from Somalia, three justices. They were Supreme Court justices at the time. I met one of them again on that line, on that line, waiting for food. As soon as he saw me, recognized me immediately. In fact, I was shocked that he could recognize me immediately. And I, he explained, told me who he was. I asked for the other two. One of them was sitting somewhere else, you know, couldn't even get up. One of them had died. But they were all in that line. That is the lot of the elite. When the elite fails to make the sacrifices that a nation requires to stay united and to believe in their nation enough not to destroy it. So it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility as the elite. Not because we are nice people. Not because we are men and women of great faith. No, but because in order to, to preserve even our own privileges, to preserve this society, to preserve this nation, we must make those sacrifices. So once more, let me thank uh, Prof for such an inspiring, you know, such an inspiring lecture. And to, and to wish, and I, and I pray, and I wish that um, our elite will respond positively to everything that we have said. Thank you very much. God bless you.